Hi, Susanna. Hi, Anna. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm really, really happy to have you here. At least it's such a beautiful Saturday morning and I am foreseeing a lovely conversation about your experience living abroad and all the different lessons that you have to teach us or to share with us today. Yeah, I'm excited to chat with you and share what I have learned. We met online only. We only met on LinkedIn. It was a mutual interest in each other's content and things that we've been creating. Somehow we realized that, yes, we have quite a similar story, at least in some parts of it, right? Living abroad, building a career, changing a career, figuring out what life is all about. It's something that I'm still doing, you know, for myself, and probably it will be a lifelong journey. So I realized that what you were talking as well was quite similar. And it really spoke to the experiences that I've been having. Sharing stories of people like you could help other people to see themselves in them and hopefully avoid certain mistakes or fast track certain things on our journeys as migrants. I am really happy to share because when I started living abroad, I had no idea and I learned by making lots of mistakes. And that's why I also started coaching and supporting people who live abroad as well, because I thought if when I was younger, if somebody would share these things with me, I could save myself lots of trouble. So I'm very happy to share. So let's do this. Well, you know how it starts. We all go in the down the memory lane, right? We talk about the first day or first week of immigration. You can choose whichever you want, because I know that you had a couple of different steps of finally arriving to where you're at. So paint the picture. How was it? So I have two actually. So one is the first time ever I went abroad on my own. That was when I was, I think, 20. I went to Sweden. It was my first trip ever. And I lived there later on. And I remember my father, he worked in the company, which was transporting goods out of Czech Republic. So he organized me a truck to get a lift to Sweden. The trip was good. I could speak Czech with the driver, but I remember very clearly, and it's like 15 years ago or something like that. The moment the driver, he dropped me off at a petrol station outside of Jeteborg in Sweden. And I went to the toilet at the petrol station. I wanted to buy something. And that moment I realized like, oh my God, I am alone here. I have to speak English. At that time I had English just from the high school. So that's not very good English. And I remember that kind of shock of being alone and having to speak a completely different language, which I never spoke outside of the English classes in the Czech Republic. So from the petrol station, I had a map. At that time, it was the usual maps, not on the phone. I don't think I had phone at that time. So I just had a map and I had a couch surfer waiting for me at the central station in Yeteborg. So I had to figure out how to get to the town, which right now I have no idea how I got there. Actually, I don't remember it. But then I remember like trying to look him up uh, in the central station. So after a while, I found him and the girlfriend went to his house and stayed a couple of days. It was amazing experience. It was also my first couch surfing experience ever. And after that, after a few days, he dropped me at the petrol station on the highway and I wanted to go to Stockholm. And that would be a whole different story. This is the first one which stuck in my memory because it was the first time ever having to speak different language, being completely on my own in a foreign country. So that really stuck in my memory and in my heart. I've never heard of anyone migrating into another country with a track. <laughs> it's such a funny kind of visual that they have because the person was from Czech Republic. So it's kind of you're traveling in this bubble. It's slow, right? It's not like you hop on the plane and you're right in a new reality and it's very shocking. It's kind of getting slowly to you. And then finally, there is this peak of realization at the gas station. Oh my God, what am I doing? Yeah. <laughs> it's such a funny visual, especially for a 20 year old girl, because I'm very similar. I migrated in the first country when I was 21. And I also was, what am I doing? Now I'm thinking like, 
what was I doing at that age? Because I surely didn't know much about life yeah. at that point. So please go ahead with the second yeah. story. Just to add on this, at the time I had uh, this big bag on me, which after that trip I said like, I'm never traveling and with that big luggage <laughs> because I didn't use half of the things and it was too heavy. But also with the age, we get more scared or we get more experienced mm. and realize the things we used to do were quite dangerous. So at that time I was alone. I was young. I was hitchhiking. I was sleeping through couch surfing and just thinking I got a lift from like three Somali guys uh, going mm. to Stockholm. And at that time I was not scared. It was perfect experience. Like nothing bad ever happened to me. But when I think of it now, I wouldn't do it now. So let me jump to the experience I wanted to share when I came first to Zambia, which is where I live now. And that has been the memory I want to share. That's been almost exactly nine years ago. And at that time I was coming to Zambia after I lived two years in Uganda already. So it was not my first African experience, but I remember it was also very different because before going to Zambia, I lived two years in Uganda and then I visited, I think, Tanzania and Ethiopia, but I have never been to Southern Africa. And I remember coming with the plane about to land to Lusaka, which is the capital of Zambia. There are these distinct wheat fields. From the sky, you see the circles. They are made in the circles because of the water. So that's very distinct. And it's at this period, it's also out of rainy season. So everything is dry and brown and dusty. And then coming out of the airport. Up to now, this is actually my favorite season. I don't know if it's affected by the fact that that was the first time I came. Then I took a taxi and I had the address of the hotel. I was coming for work. So it was from the organization I was working then. And then the taxi driver took me there. And the way I saw the city, it felt there was no traffic. It was very quiet. And in my head, I was thinking... Where I'm staying, did they put me somewhere on the outskirts of the capital? Because I won't be even able to find food, looking how few people there were, no traffic. I drop off the taxi, I, I find my room at the hotel, I ask a few questions where to find food. And now looking back, I realize I was actually at the city center of Lusaka. And this is because I was coming from Kampala, from Uganda, which Kampala is maybe, I would say, the typical African city, how people imagine it, full of traffic, noise, motorbikes, people walking everywhere. And it's also the population density in Uganda is uh, so much more dense than Zambia. So Zambia is a huge country. The number of people keeps changing, but at the time it was about 10 million people. So it's very low population density and Lusaka is kind kind of calm and quiet. If I was coming from the Czech Republic, I would be probably shocked how busy it is. But coming from Uganda, Kampala, which is very crazy in the city center, I was like, how will I find food? That was my first memory of Zambia nine years ago. Wow, so beautiful. You already started talking about things that you had in mind before coming and how they were meeting the reality, which was not how it was. And before we recorded, we talked also about all the different misconceptions that people have about Africa in general, the entire continent, how little we all know about it. I have never been in Africa and I still have to explore so many things. If you ask me certain things, like to place something on the map, I will not be able to do it. And I wonder what you learned that you think everyone should know that this is not true about Africa or Zambia or any other place that you visited in Africa. I will talk about Zambia and maybe Uganda or Tanzania where I lived in Uganda, in Tanzania, in Zambia, and especially in Zambia. It's a country of big differences. So most of what we know, and make no mistake, I was the same when I was coming first time to Africa, to Uganda. I had the same misconceptions, same stereotypes, because that's what we hear about Africa, unfortunately, in Europe. So what we usually hear is the poverty. We hear about the wild animals. We hear about the diseases. I share it almost with everybody because it was probably a bit traumatizing for me. How the doctor, before going to Africa first time, after I said, I don't want to get vaccination for everything she recommended, she said, if I die there, it's my own fault. 
I was coming with this kind of fear. I didn't know what to expect. But my point I'm trying to get across is that Af Zambia, Africa, it's a country and continent full of big differences. So, for example, in Zambia, there are the rural areas, the villages, which you wonder, did something change from the 1960s when Zambia gained independence? People still live basically on their agriculture or fishing. The income, if any, is very limited. The services like health care or education, it's not, not very good. And they still live in very traditional way. But also there are the bigger towns and cities where the life is actually not that different from Europe. Like maybe the services, they are not that great, but we have electricity, we have running water, we have hot water, we have a cafes to go and have cappuccino and a muffin. We have shopping malls, all these things. These are two parts of the same coins in Africa. And it's not like in the big cities live just foreigners, right? It's Zambians. There is this, I would say, middle class of Zambians, which live in a modern way. The last thing I want to say, it's not like we have giraffes and elephants walking everywhere, right? I can uh, share an example of my husband who went to visit the famous Zambia's Victoria Falls and some of the safaris there, first time ever with me, which was five years ago. So him as a Zambian, he has never seen it before. The animals are in the national parks. It can happen like in the city near Victoria Falls. Sometimes you can meet her of elephants crossing the street, but it's just because it's next to the national park, but the other cities, it's not there. So that would be the first thing I wanted to mention that it's really not just the poor part full of diseases, but it's also like the modern. And there are lots of people who are very smart, very innovative, coming up with excellent idea, having dreams. We are all human beings. In Europe, we get this bit of misconceptions that people in Africa, they are helpless. They are just asking for aid. And that's not completely true. Yeah, uneducated with poor sexual education with this traditional values all over what you mentioned already right was your partner we will be talking a bit more about your family and personal life and the way you learned how to build relationships with your family on another continent and you having a child and how it all works but also what you notice as differences in culture between you and your husband, things that you have learned about each other that are, and are something that you need to accept without much understanding <laughs> how much you see this in your relationship and, and your relationship between the two of your families. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for this. And this is a topic. I started with when I started coaching and mentoring. So it's kind of a topic which I have passion for because I started as a coach and mentor for women in intercultural relationships. And I learned the hard way. My relationship with my husband is the second biggest relationship I had. I was married before to an Italian man, so it was also intercultural relationship. But when we broke up and I started to be with my husband, I continued doing the things and I continued managing myself and the relationship the same way I always used to do. Without much reflection, just the way we are all kind of taught how we see our parents, what we see in our cultures. And because my husband is very different than my ex-husband, he was like, no, stop, you can't be behaving like this. What is this? And I would say in the beginning of our relationship, it was quite, quite wild. I remember lots of sleepless nights when we did at the time long distance, even if we were in Zambia, because Zambia is huge and I was working elsewhere than where he lived. And I remember the nights we would argue over the phone. I would spend whole night crying because of like these differences. It's my own personal development journey. In the beginning, I was foc focusing on the intercultural relationship, but more and more I went deeper into it. I realized that it's really more about personal development and us as a human being, as a person. It's more pronounced when your partner is from completely different culture. 
culture, but ultimately I came to believe that it's about how we are as human beings. What I was advising women in intercultural relationship is actually highly relevant for any relationship because we are all different human beings. Even if we grew up in the same city, in the same country, we are still very different. So that was kind of the big transformation I did. And that's why I do now more life coaching, because I believe that the culture is not that important as compared to our personal development and kind of managing our own thinking, our own behavior, and trying to make the relationship work. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more because my experience, and actually when you said that your ex-husband was Italian, I was like, damn, are you talking about my life? Because I also was married to an Italian person and <laughs> like nine years ago, this is where I immigrated first time. So <laughs> there is a lot of very fun synchronicity right now happening. In this yeah, country. I didn't know. <laughs> well, hopefully it was not the same one, but yeah. <laughs> No, it wasn't. But the thing is that my current partner is also Italian. Okay. And before him, I decided, no, I'm not going to do this Italian thing anymore because it's just weird. It's like another person from the same country. I have the whole world in front of me. What is happening? But then I met my partner and maybe it will be another conversation. Even between these two people from this country and very roughly from the two regions that are close to each other, these two people couldn't be more different from each other especially in the way I feel in that relationship. <laughs> so, so I can agree with you that culture probably matters less. You need to be aware of certain things, right? Let's say we're talking about different religions or we're talking about completely different upbringing. These things are important because they obviously shape the person that we are. And it also is part of our personal development. As you said, I agree with you wholeheartedly that the relationship is the journey that's um, a tool, it's this method, it's probably the most important school that we have, is for us to find ways to be with someone else. And it doesn't have to be a romantic relationship, the friendship, the relationship with the children, with parents, with the family in general, with the society. It's such a big school for us, probably because we are the social animals and this is how we evolved in general. This is such an important thing for us and it can make it or break it for us. Yeah. And I think it all comes down to communication because, as I said, with the different culture, it can be more pronounced, these differences. But then the issue is like, how do you communicate about it? I don't want to underestimate the role of the culture, but the rules or kind of the recommendation how to deal with it, it's the same, even if you are from the same culture. Our first the biggest fights when we lived together with my husband it was about tv and it sounds silly and now when i look back at it now tv is not a problem anymore but at that time we moved to a new house and it happened very fast we didn't have much in that apartment so there was a mattress there was a stove and then there was the tv and I grew up in a family when we would have the TV in a living room. You would just switch it on when you wanted to watch some program. And it was not like really important. And in my adult life, I never had a TV. Like when I was studying, it was something I just never had. And then I was like, why we have TV here? And why you're watching TV instead of chatting with me? Taking it very personally, which is probably one of the biggest lesson learned why you don't chat with me why the tv is on like you don't pay attention to me and all this two years after when i start looking back at the situation and kind of bringing a bit of more thinking into it and understanding more the culture what i discovered is that like in my husband's family and in many families in Zambia, having TV, it's kind of a bit of status. It's a sign that you are having a home. So his parents, when they got proper home, they had TV there and that was the place which kind of created the home. And what he tried to do with putting the TV in the apartment, he wanted me to feel like at home. So I took it completely the opposite way and created unnecessary argument because one, I didn't understand what he meant by doing it and I didn't try to understand it because I thought my perspective is the right one and because I took everything personally and it was actually not meant personally at all. Oh, love this. Yeah, 
it's a note to myself as well, because I'm learning how to not take things personally in general, but in a relationship, it's such a big thing. You know, you probably know it better than me. Something happens and then it seeps into the family, the conversation. It's a never didn't work. It's always there. I love what you're saying. What you said at the beginning made me a bit laugh. You said that your husband told you not to do certain things. So what were you doing that he was so upset about? I think I was very dominant, like in our previous relationship, whatever I said, like, let's do this or let's eat this. My ex-husband would go with it because he had a different personality. And there is also nothing wrong with like having different personalities. But I was just used to do stuff my own way because I'm the first child. I don't know if that affected that, mm. but I feel like the way I was growing up, I learned to deal with everything alone, to find my own solution. I was very like strong willed and I wouldn't have some things like to discuss. And it was all about my perspectives, how I see it. And now when I look back, like, I feel like I must have not been the easiest woman to be in with the relationship. And when you bring in trust issues and this kind of things, when you are insecure yourself and you project it on the other person, it creates issues. And the other thing I would mention is, which is kind of connected to being dominant, is when you feel like you should control everything in your life. In the, the coaching approach I use, I work with the saboteurs and the inner critics and one of the saboteurs is called the controller and that's one of my strongest saboteurs and what it does it wants you to control everything in your life so you get the outcomes you want so it controls you what you want to do but it also tries to control other people here in Zambia what was very different for me compared to Czech Republic is in Czech Republic when you are a family or partner people finish working maybe 15 in the afternoon 16 they go home early and in Zambia it's different many people don't have just one job that's another stereotype about Africa which is completely not true that people don't want to work but my experience is the exactly opposite that people have more than one job because they need to hustle get the money because the official employment is limited and people just have to work really hard to secure their living. So my husband, even up to now, usually he comes home between eight and nine in the evening. And in the beginning, it was very strange for me and I was not understanding. So I was like, why you don't come earlier and kind of try to control him in this way. And that's what he was not happy about because he's like, look, I'm not like sitting at the swimming pool and having drinks. I'm working. In my head, I was like, no, if you would want to spend time with me, you would be home early or maybe you're doing something else you are not telling me. And like all these stories we create in our head based probably on our past experience, based on the things we sometimes have unconsciously in us. It really affects the relationship without us really realizing. Totally. And in your work with women in the intercultural, international relationships, what do you think are the common topics that arise that we can I learn think, from? Yeah, I think often it's really the communication and some kind of impasse between the couple. Each of them have different perspective and they are just not aligning. They are not meeting and not seeing the other one's perspective because nothing is black and white. And usually I can say because lots of women who I work with, they were kind of attracted to me where the European women with partner from Africa, it's a bit different dynamics than the other combinations. So I remember one of the biggest challenges was the man, African man having to send money to the African family. And that creates a lot of issues, especially when you kind of don't communicate about it. That's what I also use with my clients, these exercises maybe I can share. Imagine that you travel to some new country, right? Like completely different culture. You have never been there. And then you see some lady in a hut doing something very strange. So as a traveler, you probably become curious. You try to watch, maybe you start talking to her, trying to understand like what is going on. You wouldn't go there and tell her, hey, lady, what the nonsense you are doing? Why you do this? Do it the way I learned in Czech Republic. Most of us, we would never do this, right? But yet we do this in a relationship with our partners. Yes, I think it comes back to what you said before, right? That 
the communication goes above the culture because ultimately it will be these two humans talking. And I remember I heard something from Esther Perel, which is the person I admire the most in this field. When we keep having the same conversation about the same thing, it's not the conversation itself that's the problem. It's something else that creates this conversation. Let's say when you were talking about the TV, it's not the TV. <laughs> It's not the toilet seat, it's not the socks. It's something that is clashing between the values or the needs or just the way you both perceive the world. At this point, they are different. And if we fight about the toilet seat or the TV or the socks, it's never going to solve it. And the culture yeah. is like litmus test or like a catalyst of certain things. It could be detonator of certain explosive conversations, but unless it becomes a problem, let's say you're with someone independent from the country, in their culture, there are certain roles, like gender roles and things like that, and you don't agree with that. So I don't think it's then a relationship you should be in. But ultimately, what's about that? The communication between two humans that just want to go along and love each other and be happy. 100% agree with you and Esther Perel, who is amazing, by the way. I like her as well. I mean, who cares about TV? Who cares about toilet seat, right? When we bring more consciousness and more reflection in what we are doing, we find out it's not about TV, it's not about toilet seat. And that brings me to another lesson I often share with my clients. If you look at something from a bigger perspective, imagine in 20 years, would this situation matter? And most of the times the answer is no. In most of the cases, and I find this mind blowing, is actually that in few years we don't even remember what we were arguing about. At that moment when we are in it, it feels like it's the most important thing in the world, but maybe in two years we don't even remember it anymore. And then why we should spend time arguing about things which don't really matter. It takes not taking things personally. It's something we can practice. Because I used to take things personally all the time and the fights we used to have, it would take whole night and then we wouldn't kind of talk to each other a couple of days. The goal is not to fight, right? We will be always fighting with our partner, but it's about like how we deal with it. So for example, now what in the past, like six or seven years ago would take a few days. Now it's done within one hour and we can go ahead with our days and have a nice day. That's beautiful. I wanted to ask you a bit more about your family and your two families living on different continents. How do you manage this dynamic? What kind of lessons, if any, came up after you made this life choice and now your family lives on two different continents? Because it has become a bit personal to me as well, because my brother and his wife, and she's about to give birth. They decided to move to Argentina. <laughs> mm -hmm. So now the family is going to be split in different continents. And while we have been living abroad, like all of us at this point, it's never been this much. So how yeah. can we deal with it? Yeah, I think the change, the biggest change when we start feeling it comes with the children. And then maybe when the parents start aging and having health issues, which is not my case yet. So my parents are still young and strong. But when my son was born and he was born in the Czech Republic, but then we moved to Zambia and he was three months. So that was just a week before the borders closed for COVID for the first time. So we were very lucky to be in Zambia during the coronavirus. It's hard, especially now when he grows up and he miss his grandparents because he really loves his grandparents and we go once a year because it's far, the cost associated with, it's not, you know, a couple of hundreds of dollars, it's in thousands. And from this perspective, it's hard because it would be very nice to have a grandparents near that he can go there every weekend. And also our situation is a bit different because we don't have typical African family. So for us, it's basically just three of us, me, my husband and our mm -hmm. son, because my husband's parents, they passed away a long time ago and they are quite small family. Even though they are in touch, they are not in habit of visiting each other regularly. Other Zambian friends tell me that I'm very lucky because I don't have to deal with lots of family issues. And for example, I never really dealt with the money issues that he would have to be supporting 10 other people. 
it's a good thing and it's a bad thing at the same time. Maybe I avoid some problems, but then we cannot never go for a date in the evening. We go for dates with my husband in the mornings when my son is at school. We can't just go out because we have nobody to stay with our son and he unfortunately don't have this part of family here. But I would say like everything has pros and cons. The families who are close to the grandparents, sometimes they have different issues. Without me deciding living abroad, I would never have this family at, in the first place. In life, I believe we have to do uh, these trade-offs and it is what it is, even if it's hard sometimes. Yes, that resonates with me. It's this trade-offs, they are part of adulting in general, right? At some point, you'll have to draw the line and say, this is how it turned out to be, and this is how it will be, irrespective of us living abroad or not. But I think it's very prominent when we live abroad, because like big, sharp difference, like in your case, right? It's two different continents, it's the situation, it's how it is, and... At this point, there is not much to do about it. So you accept it as that's the yeah. turn of life. That's how it is. I wanted to add a note about boundaries because you mentioned something earlier that when we have, we are considering to have partner from different culture and some of the culture things are something which will not work for us and it might be then not the right partner for us. So here I want to say the importance of knowing our own boundaries and knowing what we are willing to accept and what are the non-negotiables. Often myself and as well lots of my clients, we go through life without actually thinking what are our boundaries and our values, sitting and doing this alone or with a coach and thinking what's important for me in my life, what I am not willing to negotiate. And then you base your decisions on that. There were so many lessons that I got from you today. So thank you for that. I heard first about appearances, things that we don't know about, we should probably investigate and ask questions instead of running to conclusions. Then I heard a big, big lesson on communication that it goes above everything. It needs to be more important than the culture needs to be more important than the issues. It's this communication between the two people who try to figure things out. And maybe a nice trick, a nice exercise that I am going to steal from you is, will it matter in 20 years or even 10 or even five, right? Will you even remember what it was about? And the last thing that you just added about boundaries, a beautiful, beautiful thing for us to consider in any case, and especially if we're talking about intercultural, international relationships, Certain things, yes, we need to come with an open mind and try to understand and or at least accept, but there will be certain things that will be hard for us to live with. And this is where we will have to say, okay, this is it or this is not it. And it's our responsibility because if we don't set this boundary, then it will not be respected. Yeah. Maybe just the last thing towards the end, because for us living abroad and being in intercultural relationship, we usually have to deal with additional things which other people don't deal that much with. And that's advice and recommendations and just other people kind of feeling they know better than us what we should do with our lives. What is important is really find out what works for us. And it may go against the advice of friends or family or random strangers on the street who feel like they need to give you very important advice. Find out what works for you and keep experimenting until you find the right thing. Because, yeah, maybe you move to some country and after six months you realize you hate it and it's terrible and you want to go back. And you are maybe scared. No, now all the people told me I shouldn't go. Now how I will deal with this? Forget about it and experiment, play with it. It's our life and we have unfortunately just one go at it. And failure is not bad if we learn something from it. Totally agree. Well, thank you so much, Susanna, for this beautiful conversation. I am definitely going to watched again. Thank you for having me and I really hope that the men or women who are listening that it will be inspiring and maybe one or two things will help them to make their life easier. Thank you.